Right, can you see me uh, quite clearly and hear me? Thanks, Jim. Let's all go. Go. That's good. Yeah, so you can hear me okay? Yes, that's good. Thank you. Yeah, very good. Okay, well, um, I trust you'll bear with me tonight again as I use uh, PowerPoint to present my message. You know, um, as I've got a bit older, I've, uh, I suppose you could say, leaned on some of these uh, services to help. <laughs> when I was a younger, younger person, my um, brain was pretty clear and I had no problems recalling um, to my memory. But now that in my mid 80s, I'm finding that uh, sometimes my memory is not as sharp as it used to be. So um, to be able to continue to uh, be a help to the Lord's people, I have um, um, prepared my messages and then brought them onto PowerPoint and trust that uh, they'll be a blessing. Tonight, I'd like to go back to Peter's uh, letter again. I'd like to begin reading with you from First Peter the first chapter, and we'll read the first nine verses. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the pilgrims of the dispersion in Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father in sanctification of the Spirit for obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Grace to you and peace be multiplied. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of God through faith for salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith, being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be, be found to praise, honour, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ, whom having not seen you love. Though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving the end of your faith, the salvation of your souls. And we trust the Lord will add his blessing uh, to the reading of his word. So what I'd like to do tonight with the Lord's help is just to present to us and um, consider the precious things that Peter brings to us in his letter, telling us that these things are much better than silver and gold. So let's see if we can... Many believers came to faith in Christ after Peter's powerful preaching at Pentecost. They faced great opposition from the Jewish leaders who in religious hatred had crucified the Lord Jesus. The opposition was so intense that many fled their homes, left their possessions, and were scattered throughout the region of Asia Minor, which is called Turkey today. Peter wrote to these scattered believers to encourage them in their faith, calling them pilgrims, who are people, the word means people traveling to their home or to another land, and strangers, people who are aliens or foreigners living in a strange land. He reminds them this world was not their home, they're just passing through. Their true home or their land was heavenly, where an eternal inheritance awaited them. These encouragements from Peter are God-inspired to give encouragement to God's people of all time, and even for us down to our present day. Peter uses the word precious frequently in these two letters. Worldly investors rush to purchase precious metals to hedge against global financial failures. And gold and silver, we know, have some value, 
but they will eventually lose their value. We know from scripture that the precious things of this earth will all be left behind, and in fact, they will be burned up. But the believer's spiritual possessions are priceless and they are eternally valuable. They are reserved in heaven for us. And by God's grace, we are being kept by his power to possess them at the revelation of Jesus Christ in the last day. So these scattered believers had lost their earthly possessions. So we would say, well, what was left for them to cheer about? So I've thought about the seven precious things that Peter brings to us in the letter. He encourages them about these seven precious things that have eternal value. They are things that are precious to every Christian in all time. This word precious, if I could say it right in the Greek, timios, has two meanings. It means something costly, valuable, something of great worth, very expensive, even priceless. But it also conveys the thought of something honored, well-loved, greatly esteemed, highly valued, and very dear. These are the um, definitions that are given for these words. So these, thing, these precious things are very valuable and highly prized by God. And these precious things should be very valuable and highly prized by us as well. And I just thought about some other verses in Scripture. The Bible says that God's loving kindness is precious. How precious is your loving kindness, O God? Therefore, the children of men put their trust under the shadow of your wings. Wisdom is precious. The Proverbs tell us, she, wisdom, is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare with her. The Proverbs also tell us that a good reputation is precious. A good name is to be chosen rather than great riches, loving favor rather than silver and gold. And the psalm reminds us that the soul is redemp soul's redemption is precious, the ransom for a life. Or for the soul is costly or precious. No payment is ever enough. So I'd like to look at these seven precious things that Peter presents to us. We have precious blood. We have precious faith. Precious promises. Precious trials. Precious attitude. Precious living stone. And a precious headstone. So let's think about the precious blood of Christ. You were not redeemed with the silver and gold, but with the precious blood of Christ. Redemption by blood is the grand theme of the Bible. Leviticus 17 is a, an amazing chapter. And we get these words, the life of the flesh is in the blood. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And Hebrews 9.22 tells us that without shedding of blood, there is no remission or no forgiveness of sins. Israel paid the half shekel of silver as a ransom for their souls that we read of in Exodus chapter 30. And some world conquerors in days past demanded gold to release their captives. But we have been redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Many animals were slain and blood sprinkled on the altars, but they could never remove sin. It only covered it until the precious blood of Jesus Christ shed on Calvary could remove sin. And scripture tells us, for if the blood of bulls and of goats and the ashes of an heifer sprinkling the unclean, sanctified to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Hebrews 9 again tells us, not by blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. 
It is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats could take away sins, for by one offering he has perfected forever those who are sanctified. Again from Hebrews in chapter 10. So the blood of animals could never remove the stain or the guilt of sin. This could only be achieved by the precious blood of God's own Son. We believe, don't we, that the blood of Christ has unique quality. It is of infinite value because it is divine. It is efficient in the work of cleansing and forgiveness because as God's sacrificial lamb, he was without blemish. The Lord Jesus had no personal sin. His nature was clean and he was without spot. He was not defiled by sin. As he moved through this sinful world, there was no contagion, as the old hymn says, touched his soul. There was no moral deficiency or inadequacy because our Lord was sinless, perfect, and pure. Gold and silver have their earthly value, but the blood of Christ has eternal value. How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? The blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. And John tells us if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, Ephesians 1 and 7. And also the uh, Paul writes to the Ephesian believers and tells them that you Gentiles who were far off have been made near by the blood of Christ. And then John testified, he said, he was witness to this fact, that the soldier pierced the side of the Lord Jesus with a spear, and immediately blood and water came out. And he says, this was done that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And he also wrote in his epistle, this is he who came by water and by blood, Jesus Christ. And so as we reflect on this fact that John gives, I was thinking about this, John gives this testimony to this amazing fact. You see, when we think about the situation when a death has taken place, there is no blood flow. There was rather a sad incident recently in our region where a worker was killed instantly and there was some debate as to whether he had died instantly or whether he had um, lingered before he passed away. But in the accident, his limbs were severed and there was no blood flow. So they concluded that he had, it was a crushing accident. They concluded that he was killed instantly. His blood, his heart had stopped beating and there was no blood flow. But here's an amazing thing that when our Lord Jesus Christ was dead, as he was hanging on the cross, the soldier with the spear pierced his side and miraculously blood and water came out. And we understand that to be the proof to us that without the shedding of blood, there can be no remission for sin. And so our Lord Jesus Christ not only died and gave up his life, because remember, he said, no man takes my life from me. I lay it down of myself, this power, this commandment I have received from my father. But to fulfill scripture, that the scripture might be fulfilled, something happened. The soldier did what he was not told to do. He was told to break the legs of the uh, crucified people and not told to use his spear. So he didn't do what he was told to do, but he did do something that he wasn't told to do. And John says, I bear testimony to this fact that the blood of Jesus Christ was shed on Calvary. 
And so these are wonderful facts for us to consider. Scripture tells us, do not count the blood of the covenant by which we are sanctified as a common thing and insult the spirit of grace. In other words, to profane it, to count it as nothing. I find it, I don't know how you uh, feel about it, but I find it an amazing thing how this word blood has become such a cuss word in our society. I remember some years ago, a uh, dear brother and I were doing some maintenance work down at our assembly hall. And a fellow that I knew worked in an engineering shop, uh, cycled past on his bike and he pulled in and uh, I think he'd had a little bit too much to drink. But anyway, he was chatting away to me and uh, he just started using this word bloody so many times that my dear brother said to him, listen, Tom, will you just stop that? You are so, it's so offensive to me. He said, why is that? Well, he said, do you realize that the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed on the cross at Calvary was actually shed for your forgiveness to cleanse you from your sins? And God highly values blood. So why are you constantly using this as a cuss word? He was quite shocked, actually. And he said, I never, ever gave that a thought. And I thought, what a great opportunity to be able to witness. And we did. We witnessed to him and told him that he really needed to come to faith in Jesus Christ to have his sins forgiven. And the only means by which that could happen was because Christ had shed his blood on Calvary's cross. And so the multitudes in heaven, well, we read Revelation 1, unto him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. And the multitudes in heaven sing, you are worthy for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. And Revelation 12 tells us that they overcame him by the blood of the lamb. So God placed great value on blood because it is the life of the creature. God gave strict instructions to Israel on how to handle blood. Sacrificial animals must be slain at the tabernacle so that the blood could be sprinkled on the altar. And the Israelites were forbidden to eat blood. As again recorded, it's, uh, it's a lengthy chapter, Leviticus 17, covering the regulations for the use of blood. And remember that the Apostles' Advisory Letter from the Church Council, it's recorded in Acts chapter 15, that part of the concluding part of their letter was that they should abstain from eating blood. And I must say that my mother and father would never, ever buy blood puddings. They said, we are not going to use that. So we come to the old, good old hymn. What can wash away my stain? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that washes white as snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And there's that other wonderful hymn. The blood has always precious been. It's precious now to me. Through it alone my soul has rest from fear and doubt set free. O oh, wondrous is that crimson tide which from my Saviour flowed, and still in heaven my song shall be the precious, the precious blood. So let's move on to precious faith. To those who obtained like precious faith with us, by the righteousness of our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. There are many religious faiths in the world which are of human imagination, but they have no value. Peter writes to encourage these scattered believers that no matter their racial ethnicity, their faith in Jesus Christ was very precious. It was of inestimable value. These words assure us that our standing with the Lord today is the same as that of the apostles centuries ago. 
They had no special advantage over us simply because they were privileged to walk with Christ, to see him with their own eyes, and to share in his miracles. This faith is for all believers in accord with the righteousness and the impartiality of God. God doesn't respect persons. All who call on the name of the Lord, be they Jew or Gentile, will be saved. And I like this comment of Mr. Harry Ironside. He said, since Christ died for all men, God in his righteousness has opened the door of faith to everyone who desires to enter. It would be unrighteous of God to refuse anyone who desired to avail themselves of the result of Jesus' work on the cross. The very righteousness of God demands that faith be extended to all men. The reason some do not have faith is they do not heed the word. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Like precious is one word in the Greek, and it means equal in honor and privilege. It was used of foreigners who had been granted citizenship in a country. So this faith is equal in value to all who believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior. Peter writing, he says, who having not seen you love, though now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory. Peter had seen the Lord in his earthly sojourn here, but he's encouraging these believers that you may not have seen him physically, but you believe in him and all that the word reveals about him. Jesus said to Thomas, blessed are they who have not seen and yet have believed. So the object of faith, this faith is precious because of its object. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Hebrews again says that the heavens and the earth will perish, but you remain. They will grow old, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. But it's also precious because of its content. It not only brings God's riches of sanctifying grace, but it gives us the ability to understand the faith once for all delivered to the saints, as Jude explains in his short letter. It is truth that sets us apart for God's glory, and for service, and also preserves us from the evils of this godless world. This is an amazing blessing to us and a great privilege that is very precious, that when, we, especially when we look at our world and see the evils and the godlessness, to think that the faith that we have come to know and to understand that molds our lives it's a great preservation from the godless world that is all round about us. So number three, we come to the precious promises. Peter says, that whereby are given unto us exceedingly great and precious promises. God's promises are precious because their value is beyond numerical calculation. And they are exceedingly great because they come from a great God. And they lead to a great life. God's promises to us are numerous. Mr. MacDonald in his uh, commentary says there are at least 30,000 Bible promises in Scripture. And old John Bunyan said the pathway of life is strewn so thickly with the promises of God that it is impossible to take one step without treading upon one of them. They are great because their source is the unchangeable God, and they are great because they can never fail. As Romans 4.20 tells us, he is faithful that promise. When God made a promise to Abraham, because he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, surely I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply, multiply you. And so after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. For men indeed swear by the greater, and an oath for confirmation is for them an end of the dispute. Thus God, determining to show the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it with an oath. 
that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold on the hope set before us. This is the strength of the uh, confidence that we can have that the promises that God makes will never, ever be denied. We may fail to keep our promises for various reasons, but that is not so with God. Paul wrote and he said all his promises are yes and amen and are certain and sure. If we are faithless, God remains faithful. He cannot deny himself. And so I just uh, quickly thought of some of the precious promises that are given to us in God's word. We won't take the time to look up each of the scriptures, but I'm sure that most of these are very well known to you all tonight. But we have the gift of eternal life that God, that the Lord Jesus promised, as recorded in John 10 and 28. And then sins forgiven. And what's more than that, they are not just forgotten by God, but they will not be remembered anymore. I often think of that, you know, we have failing memories and we forget. And uh, sometimes we have to try hard to recall what we have forgotten. But this is a positive action that our God has taken. Not that he forgets our sins, and might just recall them again, but rather he has taken positive action and says, I will not remember them again anymore. What a wonderful promise for us to know that our sins are forgiven. And then the Lord promised the gift of the Holy Spirit that if he was to go back to the Father, uh, that he prayed the Father that the Holy Spirit would come to take his place and be able to uh, indwell and uh, enlighten all those who put their faith and trust in him. Romans 5 and 9 tells us that because of his sacrifice on Calvary and now him living at God's right hand, he has saved us from coming wrath. And he has promised, as we read in Hebrews 13, never to leave us or forsake us. He has promised as he was speaking to Lazarus and, uh, well, in particular to Martha about Lazarus, that he would raise all those in resurrection uh, to himself, all those who put their trust in him. And then we have what we read tonight from the first chapter of First Peter, our heavenly inheritance and the promise of the Lord's return to receive us to himself in John 14 and 3. Colossians 3 and 4, Paul promises that God, that we will appear with Jesus Christ in glory. Writing to the Thessalonian believers who were concerned about their loved ones that had passed on before them, he said, we will meet them again, be reunited with our loved ones. And then in 1 Corinthians 10, Paul reminds us that God gives promises to give victory over temptation and also that for those that love God, all things work together for our good. And I was thinking about Joshua's parting words that he spoke to Israel. Now I am about to go the way of all the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of all the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. So those are tremendous words for us to uh, put our feet on and to rejoice in, in the fact that God has given to us exceedingly great and precious promises. But then Peter goes on and he reminds us that there are trials that will come our way and he calls these trials precious. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a while, if need be, you have been grieved by various trials, that the genuineness of your faith being much more precious than gold that perishes, though it is tested by fire, might be found to praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. 
Peter is teaching us to expect some trials on our journey home to glory. He had mentioned the rich inheritance reserved in heaven that caused them to rejoice. But they were presently experiencing much pain and suffering. And we could say this is the paradox of the Christian faith, the Christian life, that gladness can coexist with sadness. Peter encourages these troubled believers that the difficulties they were experiencing were a part of God's plan to strengthen their faith, to mold their character in preparation for heavenly service. Although unpleasant, God uses trials to transform us into the image of Christ. And we read these words I've chosen, the New Living Translation. Dear friends, don't be surprised at the fiery trials you are going through, as if something strange were happening to you. Instead, be very glad, for these trials make you partners with Christ in his suffering, so that you will have the wonderful joy of seeing his glory when it is revealed to all the world. If you are insulted because you bear the name of Christ, you will be blessed, for the glorious spirit of God rests upon you. If you suffer, however, it must not be for murder, stealing, making trouble, or prying into other people's affairs. But it is no shame to suffer for being a Christian. Praise God for the privilege of being called by his name. That gives us a great overview of the uh, way in which God deals with us as his children. And what a blessing it is for us to suffer and realize that in this way we are identifying ourselves with our Lord Jesus and his sufferings. So I thought of it, there are three factors to perhaps consider in relation to suffering that Peter brings before us. He says, these trials are temporary. They are for a season. Trials are not for our destruction, but to instruct us, not as a punishment, but for the purging and perfecting of our faith. Always remember, God controls the trials that he sends. And as someone has put it, he has his eye on the clock and he will not allow us to suffer more than we are able to endure. But then trials are profitable, Peter said, if need be. First of all, they come for a season, temporary. They are profitable if need be. Every child of God will have some suffering whom the Lord loves he chastens for our profit to be partakers of his holiness. God knows when we need trials to perhaps discipline us if we have disobeyed his will or if we have sinned or to prevent us from sinning or for our spiritual growth. And then thirdly, the trials are varied. In different ways, they come to us. They may come through opposition or persecution, sickness, family troubles, hardship, job loss, business failures, etc. They are um, manifest in different ways through different circumstances. And so we conclude that these testings are to show the genuineness of our faith. Genuine faith will find praise, honor, and glory at the revelation of Jesus Christ. We think of the realities of suffering. Peter goes on to speak about rejoicing in suffering, and James concurs with him when he begins his letter by saying, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience, but let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Peter acknowledges that trials aren't easy. He uses the word heaviness, which means that which is difficult, and it's a word that is used about the experience of our Lord as he previewed Calvary. And when Paul writing to the believers in Thessalonica, he said to them that they were in heaviness. They were concerned and facing many difficulties in their pathway of following the Lord. But trials come lighter when we realize they produce endurance and strength of character. 
and are in preparation for glory. So these different uh, writers of scripture, Paul and Peter uh, and James, are all sharing or, or giving us the same view with regard to suffering. They have a purpose to strengthen us, to mold us, and in preparation for the glory that is to come. Not only rejoicing in suffering, but refined through suffering. This process is to remove the impurities from our lives. Impurities and precious metals are removed by the heat of the furnace. This is to prove its genuineness and reveal its value. God uses trials to prove the reality of our faith and to remove the dross from our lives. The silversmith knew the impurities were gone when he saw his reflection in the molten metal. So God refines us to reflect the beauty of Jesus Christ in our lives. And then resigned to suffering. Hebrews 12 tells us, My son, do not make light of the Lord's discipline, or do not lose heart when he rebukes you, because the Lord disciplines the one he loves, and he chastens everyone he accepts as his son. Endure hardship as discipline. God is treating you as his children. For what children are not disciplined by their father? We don't give in, faint under trials, but we willingly submit knowing that our light affliction is for a moment that is working for us a far more exceeding weight of glory. And we think of Paul's tremendous words that he wrote to the Roman Christians. I reckon that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory that will be revealed in us. So no wonder Peter could uh, explain the sufferings that believers go through as something that is very precious to God and very valuable for God's people. We move further now to number five, and I've headed this, a precious attitude. Peter writes these words, Likewise, you wives, be submissive to your own husbands, that even if some do not obey the word, they, without a word, may be won by the conduct of their wives when they observe your chaste conduct accompanied by fear. Do not let your adornment be merely outward, arranging the hair, wearing gold, or putting on fine apparel. Rather, let it be the hidden person of the heart, with the incorruptible beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which is very precious in the sight of God. For in this manner, in former times, the holy women who trusted in God also adorned themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. The Bible tells us that a well-ordered home with a husband as head and a submissive wife, with obedient children as precious to God and very valuable in the community. Peter writes firstly to encourage wives to conform to God's order. The word likewise refers back to the example of Jesus who willingly submitted to God's will and suffering for our sins, as recorded in 1 Peter 2 in those closing verses of the chapter. This teaching is so against our 21st century thinking. We just look at our world and look at this uh, and how this is totally rejected today. And then sadly, it's being abused by some rel religious sects, as we see in the latest news that's happening over there on the west coast of the South Island. Peter shows how this meekness and quietness should be displayed in three ways. We ask the question, suppression or submission? There's no suggestion here of any women's inferiority, but this is a recognition of creation's order. God ordained that there be authority and respect in marriage and the home, which is the foundation of human society. The lack of this order is very evident in today's world and has become a battleground for women's equality. 
And sadly, this is coming into the evangelical church. Paul agreed with Peter, wives, submit to your own husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and be not bitter against them. And in Ephesians, he wrote, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands and everything. Husbands, love your wives as Christ also loved the church and gave himself for her. So Christ's mm -hmm. sacrificial love for his bride, the church, sets the high standard for husbands. And I have highlighted, you will notice, that in each of these scriptures, they emphasize that the wife is to be subject to their own husband, not other husbands. They are very specific about this. It's a husband and wife relationship in the marriage relationship. God gave the husband headship in the home and the wife submission to her own husband and everything. And of course, we accept if he wanted her to disobey God. The husband must not dominate and suppress his wife but lavish her with love and honor her femininity and her physical delicacy. The husband's attitude of loving consideration to his wife will make it easy for her to defer to him, just as Sarah deferred to Abraham calling him Lord. Not so much in word, but in her attitudes and in her actions, as is recorded for us in Genesis 18. God created, created Adam first, and then he created Eve from himself to be his helper and to complement him for reproduction. In their transgression, Adam was held accountable because he was created in the place of authority. Um, but Romans chapter 5 and those verses 16 to 17, that Paul clearly sets this out, that Adam is the one who is the head of humanity, and by one man's transgression, sin has come into the world. But wonderfully, by one man's obedience, our Lord Jesus Christ, we have been made righteous by our faith in him. And so we ask, secondly, then, cosmetics or character. Peter instructs a believing wife how to win her unsaved husband, not so much by outward adornment or constant preaching at him, but by her meekness of conduct as the saintly women of old. And Mr. Vine makes this comment in his dictionary about meekness. It is not weakness, but it is an inward grace of the soul chiefly towards God, and is the opposite of self-assertion and self-interest. Now, Peter isn't forbidding any outward adornment, suggesting a woman neglect her personal appearance. In fact, when we go to Proverbs chapter 31, and it speaks about the woman who above, who is above rubies, she is actually commended for the way in which she adorned herself. But here, the apostle is telling us that her chief adornment is spiritual, not natural. Peter contrasts a woman's outer beauty with her inner beauty. One is artificial and fading, and the other is real and lasting. So what is truly valuable to God and attractive to men is a wife with a submissive attitude and a beautiful character. Peter isn't advocating that Christian women should look dowdy or old-fashioned, but dress in a way that enhances the gospel. And so we might say, which mirror gets the most use? The mirror that's on the wall or the mirror of God's word? This is something that is brought before us throughout the New Testament. This submissive order from creation is also on display when the church gathers by the different roles that are given to men and women, the gender roles. And that is clearly, we haven't got time to go into those verses tonight, but I'm sure we're all quite aware of Paul's teaching in 1 Corinthians 11, 
verses 2 to 16, of order between men and women as they acknowledge headship to Christ and God in the church and also the woman's place in audible um, um, action in the church in 1 Timothy 2, 8 to 15. And then thirdly, career or a carer. Peter uses Sarah as an example of a godly wife who was blessed for her kind of hospitality and she actually cared for angels unawares. The influence of a godly mother who submits to her husband and cares for her children is indispensable in the home and an absolute necessity in the community. How our society is suffering today with lawless children through single parent homes and a lack of fatherly discipline. Mothers having to work to make ends meet is sometimes required, but a mother who sacrifices her worldly career for her family's care will reap a great reward. A worldly career will never substitute for a godly mother's care for her family. These qualities are greatly despised in today's world, but these qualities are very precious and of inestimable value before our God. And then number six, Peter speaks about the living stone, the precious living stone. Coming to him as a living stone, rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. Therefore, to you who believe, he is precious. Peter refers to the Lord Jesus as the living stone who is especially chosen and very precious to God. He is the only begotten son who is in the bosom of the father in that place of love and affection who loved him before the foundation of the world. This stone was counted of no value by men and was cast aside as they despised and rejected him. But God highly honored and exalted him to his right hand. For this reason, the Lord Jesus could say, the Father loves me because I lay down my life so that I may take it again. The term living stones illustrates the vital relationship believers have with Jesus Christ. In him we have eternal life, therefore he is very precious to believers. He gave his life to redeem us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And as John records, we love him because he first loved us and gave himself a ransom for all. The stone concept was of great value to these scattered Jewish believers who had lost access to their earthly temple. Peter teaches them that they are part of a far greater temple of living stones deriving their life and their cohesion that which binds together from Jesus Christ, the true life giver. I'm sure Peter is thinking back to Caesarea Philippi when he confessed, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus replied, you are Peter. The word is Petros or a stone. And on this rock, Petra, which means a rock, I will build my church. That confession made Peter a living stone or we could say a building stone in the church, that living organism that God is building. Peter was not the foundational rock of the church. The Lord Jesus is the rock, and we, like Peter, are stones that are being built into God's building. God declares there is no one to compare with his son. He is God's elect. He, he is specially chosen one, and very precious. And as we remember Peter's great words in his, um, his message in Acts chapter 4, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. We conclude that there is no life and inclusion in God's church without him. The Lord Jesus could say, I have come that they may have life more abundantly. He is the living stone, the living Lord Jesus, the life giver to all who believe. So this living relationship has constituted every believer to be a living stone and a royal priest to declare the glories of our Savior and Lord. And finally, the seventh precious 
thing that Peter writes about. Behold, I lay in Zion for a foundation of stone, a chief cornerstone, elect and precious. Peter now draws from Isaiah's prophecy to say that Jesus Christ is specially chosen by God to be both the foundation stone and also the headstone the one that the Jewish leaders rejected. He is the foundation stone on which the whole building is laid. As we remember Paul's words to the Corinthians, are the foundation can no one lay than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. He is also the cornerstone from which the whole building takes its alignment. We could say he is our pattern to follow the chief cornerstone in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord. I remember when I was uh, first married and uh, we uh, moved into our house and um, I was building a, putting up a concrete wall and I was having a bit of trouble getting it straight. And um, my wife nursed with a lady whose son was an apprentice, had become an apprentice um, um, but, um, not a builder. What am I looking for? A uh, anyway, um, laid concrete blocks, and so he came up and said to me, "Oh, Jim, you're you're not doing it right." He said, "What you've got to do," he said, "is to put down your cornerstones first, then put up your line, and he said, then you can get your alignment from from for all the other blocks." And I thought about that when he, just as he was telling me, I thought, well, you know, our Bible tells us that Jesus Christ is our chief cornerstone, the one who has been laid on the foundation, and from him we take our, our alignment. But then he's not only that, is he the foundation stone and the cornerstone, but the scripture also tells us that he is the headstone of the corner. And so he has the preeminent place in the building. The stone rejected by your builders has become the head of the corner. God has given him to be head over all things. He is now seated at the right hand of God, far above all principality and power, might and dominion, and every name that is named, as Ephesians 1 tells us. And he is the head of the body, the church, the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he might have the preeminence. His name is above every other name. So in summary, we could say that our Lord Jesus is the foundation stone. He is the one that gives stability and security for all those who have come to him by faith. He is the cornerstone. He is the one who gives alignment and accuracy from whom we uh, um, take our um, build our lives and are built into him and then he is the headstone he is the one that has the preeminence and all authority and so this is the one that we have come to know that peter tells us is extremely precious so as we reflect on these things tonight these precious things that peter considers to be of supreme value May we compare our own value system. May we value all things in our lives in the light of eternity. And may we treasure these precious things God has given to encourage us too as pilgrims and strangers as we are journeying to our heavenly home. So may the Lord bless these uh, meditations to us. So let's just give him thanks for his word. Heavenly Father, we just come before you tonight and thank you again for another opportunity just to gather in this way, to be able to share your word, to read it, and to allow your Holy Spirit to make it real to us, to realize that we have been introduced into a realm of things that are beyond the value of, uh, of human values, but they are values that have eternal value and consequence. And so as we reflect on these seven precious things that Peter writes about to encourage those believers that he had um, had something to do with as they were scattered from their homes and writing to encourage them, 
because he was inspired, we believe that they have the same value for us who are your believing people today. And so we just ask for your blessing on your word as we have read it and considered it together tonight. And thank you that this all comes to us because of what our Lord Jesus Christ has done in giving himself on Calvary's cross. We ask mm. your blessing in his worthy and precious name. Amen. Mm.